Oh, why is it on that? Why is it this lower third? This isn't working. Hold on. Let's fix this. There we go. There we go. That's what it should be. See? Now Ryan's on the show. Without your name, it didn't really work. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Kessel Chat, where Ryan and I get to talk about all kinds of geekery related to Star Wars and everything else under the sun that we decide. Like the DC universe or the dc snyder cut like we did last time for i don't even know yes. how long <laughs> yeah that was worth it it, it was great worth um it. uh, uh also if if people are still uh watching that you, uh, you've got my prayers with you uh, it's four <laughs> hours. It takes forever it's it's like you it's a commitment it's ha- uh, what is it the, the guy said on a, a pitch a pitch meeting it's half a work day <laughs> um uh so yeah uh, it's, it's a it's a it's a long haul we'll it's see a, it's for, it's so for everybody in dev tomorrow since we have a day off like everyone in dev can just take half the day and watch the Snyder cut see perfect it, I this mean, is why it was done for us yes exactly i think that was the whole purpose behind <laughs> it you know we feel out of Cisco live and they're like look we know that the snyder cut dropped you we need know a break, that there's a lot so... of like you know dc people that are here you know so we got to give people time for uh and you're gonna for need to, like it. you watch this like an hour chunks you watch like an hour you take a quick break you have a little snack watch an hour it's gonna take a oh, day it's gonna be a whole thing uh, it is it is because i needed those breaks like when the chapters came up i was like thank thank goodness yes um, <laughs> anyway, not... okay here's a good pause here's a good pause for tonight yeah just hit the, we're just gonna chill the tv for tonight We'll come back to this tomorrow or later. <laughs> no, no, I'll tell you, it's it's. Uh, I I would not recommend a sitting. I know people that were like, I know what I got to do. I got to watch Man of Steel, the Ultimate BVS cut, and then uh, the uh, Snyder cut and uh, of of Justice League. And it's like that's that's like a day and a half. Like oh, easily. that's a lot of that's like, um, that's that's like committing of, to like yeah. watching the Lord of the Ring, the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings extended version in one sitting that's like 12 yep. hours of content you are watching i mean yes worth yeah. it but it's still it's all it's oh, all no, totally. sure. like 
like an amazing experience. I've actually, um, I had a really long flight once and I made it through like uh, the fellowship and two towers. But this Holy is like, crap. if you were going to say, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to take on, um, uh, I'm going to watch all of Star Wars. I'm going to watch four, five, and six, one, two, and three, and then seven, eight, and nine. It's like that, that could just be exhausting. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, and I'm as much as you might love Star Wars, it's still a lot of content to watch through. It is. Yep. No, totally. It's it's a lot. It's a lot. You're asking a lot from people, and uh, and Zack Snyder. Uh, I think it was uh, Jason Manzukas on one of the podcasts that I listened to. He said watching the Snyder cut is like watch is like brutalist architecture. It's like one of these things where it's like it is just hitting you in the face. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's a commitment. It's, if you're going to do it, it's like, you know, uh, again, uh, uh, kudos to those people who from our last show to this show may still be watching the Snyder, <laughs> you know, doing the Lord's work. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing that you're trying to do. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. We're always jumping around on topics where we jump around it's totally from, fine. uh, which is totally cool. But I know that, I know that we're here on the Kessel chat. Um, to uh, uh, talk a lot about the things that we love about the Star Wars universe. So I'm, I'm really excited to kind of pick up where now, we left you, off. You know what I haven't watched yet? Before we get into our main topic for the night, what I haven't mm. watched yet is the the other Clone Wars series. I haven't, I, oh. I've, I, we talked about it extensively. And yeah. I've been so busy like the last week and a half. I was on PT, I was on vacation the week before that, that yesterday in my news feed popped up and it's like how Anakin and, and uh, what we learned about Anakin that was so different. I'm like, Oh my God, how did I forget to watch this? I'm like, crap. So <laughs> tomorrow my son's in school. My wife's working all day long. You know what I'm doing. I am streaming oh. clone wars animated series. All I'm doing is going to lay on the couch with a cardigan on and a <laughs> beverage in my hand. And I'm going to watch nothing but clone wars all day. That's it. It won't take the whole day, but I, that's all I'm doing tomorrow. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So one, congratulations to future Jeff because they're going to be like, oh man, this is like life changing. Um, uh, the, I will, uh, some, some things that I will say is that, uh, again, I loved the first season. There are these tiny little vignettes mm -hmm. and you can just consume them, consume them, consume them. And they're all kind of interrelated and they're fun and they're great. And, uh, the, the Anakin story is great, especially in comparison to how Anakin is dealing with his villain versus how Obi-Wan is dealing with his, um, uh, where, where one confronts and how they do that, how one surrenders. And, you know, it's, oh, it's great. It's really good. You're, you're going to enjoy this. The, um, the, the second season though is, uh, and I don't mean to get super serious, but I mean, it is like, it's one of my favorite pieces of Star Wars. Like, I love that second, uh, that second season. I feel like they, they were told go big, go really big mm -hmm. here. And, um, I, the, the whole Nelvon warrior thing, uh, I think it's Nelvana three. I think that's the name of the planet. Um, and then the heist, the palp, palp heist, yes. um, uh, but I'm uh, when I watched that, I remember thinking, well, I wish that was episode two. I, I, I mean, and not that I admit, not that I didn't like Attack of the Clones. I have my issues with it, but I still wish I would have seen that palp heist in live action. Yeah, um, oh god, yes, uh, it would have been a lot, of, a lot of fun. God, that would have been so intense to watch. I, I, so I've seen that one episode, or at least part of that episode um, of that series. You know, back in the early 2000s, when a friend of mine showed it to me, I was like. Oh, that, like that's where I learned about Grievous. Like, like that's actually where I learned about. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, why is he coughing and hacking away? I'm like, oh my god! Like, mm -hmm. so watching that was like they're yeah. bouncing around and they're like they're running from place to place and jumping off things and I, I forget what species that the one Jedi is that um, looks like the snow the snow beast from Hoth, uh, not snow beast because he is actually from Hoth, but like has the little tube mouth and he's running around carrying Palpatine the whole time on his shoulder, like jumping off of things yep. and running throughout Coruscant. No, that's and that that is awesome. Again, uh, the best part is is both of the two Jedi's um, that are with uh, I think it's Shakti. I, I could mm -hmm. be wrong oh, on yeah, that name. Yeah. No, it's Shakti. Yeah, yeah. Um, so your your the the two Jedi's that are accompanying Shakti are other aliens that you saw in the Cantina scene in Episode Four, where it's the one guy who's like. Bum, 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 bum. You know, yep. it's like he's got the little the little pipe mouth, and then yeah, we already talked about coffee grinder alien, um, where he sound he talks like he sounds like the coffee grinder. Um, uh, he's got four throats, and um, they're called uh, that, um, 
what are they? Sorry, you can sorry. Starts with O. Um, and of course, I'm I'm. There's someone that's watching this right now, and they're like, and you say that you can represent Kessel Chat. Um, <laughs> uh, in all reality, it, it, I I I'm blanking on the name of the alien, but I will say I could just say coffee grinder, um, because he sounds like a coffee grinder when he talks. But that whole sequence is amazing. I love it. There's a great action sequence that's there. But to see Anakin um, on that planet with the Nelvons, uh, with the uh, uh, dealing with the Techno Union, oh, which yeah, is yeah. one of my favorite names of anything. I if I ever start a company, it'll be called the Techno, techno Union. Union. <laughs> um, uh, but the Techno Union is there on this planet on Nelvana Three, and it's it's just great um uh all parts of this episode are great i love the way that 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 whole season starts um there's uh, uh parts of it that are very much like what the mandalorian is inspired by so yeah it's it's great it's 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 one of my favorites i am excited do you ever watch uh forces of destiny yeah the other- uh, occasionally i do yeah. watch forces of destiny i haven't i haven't watched it a lot lately but i occasionally when it comes on i'll catch it i did is that i liked it okay. I, I i liked it because it was the for me, like I tried to get my son to watch it a few times. Um, I liked it because it was the, <clears throat> it's not like you were learning a lot new about these characters at all, but I loved that the, the idea of like, <clears throat> so in the, the Dave Filoni Clone Wars series, where at the beginning of every episode, there'd be a little quote that was some yep. inspirational Jedi motivational type quote, but it was yep. really simple, almost haiku in its in yep. simplicity. Um, I liked how every episode of uh, Forces of Destiny was sort of centered around a message like that really short, really simple featuring one or maybe two characters, but they all send around some sort of like, I don't want to say positive message, but sort of like learning lesson. And I liked, I liked that because it was like, it was good for kids in that like taught them a a nice lesson while also giving them sort of a taste of what star Wars is like, but all these different characters from like every era of star Wars in a very casual way, like, Oh, they're all just existing. They like, these didn't happen in the past or the future. They're just like, bits and pieces of like almost like you were like you brought the cast back in to do some vignettes afterwards or like we did some we did some we did some pickups afterwards and like we just brought the characters back in to do some pickups after original shooting and this is what you got out of that like these little these little pieces like not like the video the movies originally were shot over like 35 40 years it was like ah they were just shot no big deal like we brought them we bought them these for these little scenes and there you go um he wasn't yeah. super into it when I, they first came out, which was a couple of years ago. But I've always liked it for that. Like they're not super deep, and you're not gonna like get a whole episode and like, oh wow, I loved watching Star Wars. But it was <laughs> it was enough to be like, you know what? This is cool. It's like a neat little message they put into there, while also still getting some of some taste of, you know, Hera or Sabine or Rey or Leia or whatever. Like I liked, I, I really liked that. And of course, Ma, uh, Maz, like getting getting Maz, like getting her getting just her her character do more than simply be like in a cantina or flying on a rocket pack talking weird about Benicia del Toro, like being kind of <laughs> like some subcons- like subvertly sexual about Benicia del Toro. I'm like, what did you do? <laughs> or not him? Uh, but no, not not him. But the who is that actor? That oh Irish yeah, actor. DJ. DJ, yes. that's the yeah, yeah. character. Yeah. Sorry, the wrong. I was thinking yeah. the wrong character. Yeah, it was not Benicio. It was like the guy they're actually looking for, which is that other dude in the end. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it was it, Justin Thoreau was playing. Justin him. He Thoreau. Wears, yeah. Thank you, Justin yeah, Thoreau. It's actually little, his. Uh, he's the high gambler, the high stakes gambler. Yeah, he's the uh, guy the they're actually looking breaker. for. That she's like, he can do things. I'm like, wait, Maz, what are you? What, <laughs> what is happening here? <laughs> Wait, but uh, I thought awesome. you liked Wookiees. I thought you liked too. I'm very confused about everything that's happening here. <laughs> oh, hey, you know, I mean, that, that's uh, that's what you get with uh, Maz. I, I actually really hey, like that old. character. I, I wish, mean, I wish they would have spent more time. Yeah, in fact, I you know, I I I like that the character appeared in Rise of Skywalker. I, I think yes. uh it there was so much depth that they added there. Um, and that's also a really good example of um. Uh, taking a great actor um, and putting them into a, a role that they can really expand and build upon. Uh, I love Maz. Uh, I think I, I enjoyed that character. I enjoyed the uh, the whole uh, playfulness. I love how it was like, I like that Wookiee. Uh, <laughs> I like that Wookiee. She's so forceful I, about it. And you're like, okay got you <laughs> no exactly it's like it's like she's very she's she's you know uh she's got exactly what she wants but i love the the she was very connected to the force i liked how it was a play on what a jedi is yeah. which is a, someone who is like 
a believer in the Force. It's uh, very much like the uh, two characters in Rogue One um, who are the Guardians of the Wills. Yes. Um, yeah. um, uh, I, I like people that are like on the peripheral of the Force. Like we've got enough Jedis. We've got enough monks. We've got enough people that are like, this is my religion. I love the people that are like, oh, no, I know of the Force. I am not a Jedi, but I know the Force. Yeah. And uh, yeah. on all of those characters, I love them because they're they're the uh, really great stories are filled with really great side characters yeah. who are also trying to teach lessons to your main characters. Uh, so to your point, that's exactly like, I, I love that Dave Filoni, the starts of the Clone Wars where it's like, you know, bum, 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 you know, it's very, that kind of like army kind of uh, snare drum version of, of Star Wars yes. where they'll have those quotes pop up. Um, uh, no, I, I really like Chaos that. Um, across the galaxy. Yep. Fighting no, the Separatists. Exactly. Yeah. I, you know, I think speaking of Maz, like, you don't really know for sure whether she actually has any actual force sensitivity or not, but it's very oh, yeah. much implied that she does. And I think that's my, to your point, that's my favorite part about her character and many others like her, because like you said, we don't need more monks. We don't need more of the space wizards type thing. What we need are people yeah. who like, you have to imagine there is not just you learn the force, either dark or light, or you don't mm -hmm. the end. Like, Clearly, that's not how a galaxy like this, or if there really was a force, it wouldn't be that black and white. It wouldn't, it would never. I mean, I don't care how many yep. Jedi exist in the galaxy during the High Republic, as an example. Like, Sith are not a thing at that point. The High Republic's everywhere. Like, no matter how many Je Je Jedi there are, there's no way that they're going to find every kid out there who is force sensitive. They're still relying on someone to tell them this kid is force sensitive. Maybe we can find them. And what about families who say, no, you can't have my kid? Yeah, that happens because who wants to let go of their kid? Like, who wants to make that a thing? So, like, how many people out there were the family's like, no, we're not going to hand you over to the, the Jedi and make that a thing, not in a negative way, but like who grew up and they're gonna, it's gonna manifest itself in some way at some point. And some people may go, I'll ignore it and I'll just not do anything with it. And then some people like Maz embrace it, but they just never were trained as a Jedi, but they still understand what, and they're still a good person and a good creature and they know what they want. I like that. To your point, it, it creates a level of depth because it gives, it creates a, a positive tension for the positive character to also be like, look, somebody else can challenge how you believe in the perspective you have, but it doesn't have to be challenged in a negative way. Like it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be a polar or a binary challenge of like your good. And the challenge of what you believe comes from the polar opposite. It doesn't have to be that it yep. can be polar as in like someone else who like Maz agrees with you. She's on the light side. She's on the, but she's going to challenge how you view what you're viewing, like looking to the positive side of things, but through a different lens uh, and a different viewpoint, which is as humans, we all can appreciate that. Like we all need to see things from a different perspective to have some empathy for it and try to understand and learn better, which is, I know this is not what you and I plan to talk about tonight, but oh, no, it, no. Uh, I mean, I could, I could get into this. Like, I mean, I again, it, I know that we talked about this in the last, in the last call, but I'm, I'm a big fan of gray characters. Dude, um, it, it I, I don't think you, yeah, sorry, Go ahead. Say, it gets me to, um, that the scene in, re, in, um, in the last Jedi where Ray is on, um, Octo with Luke and he's like, I'll give you three lessons or whatever it was. And <laughs> then she finds that one dark side Nexus, like on Dagobah, she finds the dark side Nexus yep. and she falls into it. And then when he pulls her out, he's like, you found the dark side and you just, you just went straight for it. You didn't even try to stop. And I'm like, that is such a binary way to look at that. Like it's, she's not evil. She has done nothing yep. evil. Something she was curious about something and she wanted to understand it. Like that is such a, if you put it in like our current terms, that is such a draconian is probably not the word I'm looking for, but like, um, it's a very dogmatic way of looking yeah. at the world. It's like, it's either this or like, of course that other thing is evil. Don't go learn anything about it. Like, what do you mean? Don't learn anything about it. Of course, I'm not trying to be it. I just want to understand what it is so I can get the perspective and try to say, look, I don't want to be that thing. Like, I don't, not to be like horrible about this, but like, I don't want to be a Nazi. I don't believe them. I don't feel the way they oh, do. Oh yeah. Nothing. But do I want to understand what led the people to that point that they felt like they needed to follow this, this um, masochistic sort of figure to get there? Yeah. I'd like to understand that because it's not that I think history repeats itself. That's too easy to say. I think it's people can become desperate and they were desperate in that case. It's the same thing in the star Wars stories. It's like, People become desperate and they follow a thing because they're like, I need something and no one else is giving it to me. Food. 
water. Oh yeah. Life, no, whatever. I'm... Like, and this thing is going to give it to you. Like, hell yeah, I'm going to go follow that. And if it asked me to do some stuff that I'm not super comfortable with, yeah, but you're still feeding me and I was going to die otherwise. If it's that black and white, well, yeah, you can understand how people or creatures would make the decisions they make. And understanding that helps to connect with those beings so that you can help them in some way. But if you don't understand that, then like, how could you expect to ever communicate effectively with them? And so when I no, heard him no, no. make that statement, like that very like binary, like, and you just went straight for it. Yeah, what else would I do? Like not learn about it? Like, oh, nope, sorry. I'm not going to learn. Just avoid that. Caution tape around it. Co orange cones. You know, lights are flashing. Beep, beep, beep. Construction's going on. Stay away. Like, no, I want to know what's in there. I want to understand why <laughs> that even exists. Actually, I, I really like this as a topic. And um, the, the reason why is, is like multifold. Like one, um, uh, one you know, there, there, there are terrible things in human history. And, uh, you know, you could you brought up, for example, like, you know, Nazis and all these like terrible things that have happened. And like, how do people go this way? How are people seduced into that part of things? And um, there's actually a bunch of different things that come up in Star Wars where they talk about that. And one of them is um, uh, when uh, Obi-Wan says um, only a Sith would deal in absolutes. And I actually think that that, even though that itself is an absolute, uh, so just, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a, that's a, you know, just as someone who has a, you know, degree in English, I was like, ah, but I got you. Um, uh, but I think that it's the extremists of both sides that are the problem. And even Palpatine has like the way he's able to seduce Anakin is by saying, well, you know, we can't, if you want to understand the whole mystery, you can't just look at the narrow dogmatic view of the Jedi, which I think has some value that said um there is a great scene where luke and yoda are training together on dagobah and um luke says but how will i know the good from the bad and this is our hero um how will i know the good side from the bad and uh yoda says you will know when you're calm at peace passive the, net, the Jedi use the Force for knowledge and defense, never for uh, attack. And I actually liked that as, um, uh, and this might be a, a very immature look of Star Wars at the time because they hadn't built all of this other stuff with it. But uh, uh, Yoda in this very like Zen, um, uh, very Eastern philosophy is really saying, Look, there are multiple, the, the force has multiple sides to it. But if you're worried about how you might, how you might be pushed into the wrong thing to do, know that when you're passive, when you're calm at peace, those things that come out of you there, that is, is the, the, that's the best part of the force. Uh, that it's not the good side versus the bad. It's, it's all in how we utilize it. And um, that goes back to even things like um, what's, you know, I feel something in that cave. He's on Dagobah. I feel something in that cave. It, it's cold. I feel cold. Uh, death. Um, yeah. That cave is strong in the dark side of the force. Uh, what's in there? Only what you take with you. Um, uh, so all of those things, I think, play into that. And um, and like you, like I, um, I, I detest like all of this, you know, terrible discrimination, all of these things. And I think that in stories like this, you can see how all of those terrible things like discrimination, like the horrors that we've seen in humanity really come from people that, uh, that occupy extremist points of view where it's like, it can only be this way. This like and binary everything else sort want. of like, it's either this or it's this. It's like, this it, exactly. Because you know what that allows to build us and them and, and us. That's, need oh to my God. That, is such a, from them. that statement right there is such a good corollary to so much of what we're dealing with right now in reality, which I think is why yep. Star Wars, at least for me, and I know for, I believe for you, like why oh, yeah. this is also powerful is because it's a lot of our political system in the States, but globally too, we're seeing more and more is create an us and them scenario. And mm -hmm. it, because if you create that as an extremist, if you're somebody who is of the mindset that like, I can use this extreme viewpoint to garner people to come to my viewpoint um you create an us and them and it doesn't have to be i don't even have to describe the them i can just make it them are taking something away from us and that's it that's all mm -hmm. you need to say and it drives people to go wait hold on i'm losing out i don't care who them is but they're not they're they're an other they're they and i think yep 
so much of what we see in Star Wars or have seen in Star Wars, but I'm starting to see is different in the way that they're portraying um, like the High Republic characters is there's so much more nuance there. But in classic Star Wars, there wasn't. I mean, in the what we wanted to talk about tonight originally was like sort of this extended universe <laughs> stuff. But I think this it bleeds together because in the current version, like the Skywalker era of Star Wars, there's not a lot of nuance, at least. There wasn't until about 10 years ago when we started to see some of these new movies. Like when we saw Solo come, I mean, Solo, it, this is within the last 10 years, but Solo mm -hmm. and Rogue One, we, Rogue One was, we've talked about this before. For me is like, it creates this character depth of the rest of the galaxy, not the Jedi, yep. not the Sith, not the force users, but the other people, everybody else out there who is dealing with all the crap. It creates this level of, I don't want to just say as simple as simple as humanity, because it's not just humans in the stories, but sentient mm -hmm. beings who realize like, like I've got to deal with this. There is no group like the Jedi that's just going to swoop in and save us. We got to do this crap on our own. What do we mm -hmm. do? And how do we do it? How does it emotionally affect us? And like road one was such a, a gritty movie that showed you how people actually felt and what was really affecting them. And I prefer that. I mean, I love the Jedi stuff. I love that. I love that part of the story, but watching things like rogue one to me show you this is what really people would go through. There's a small yeah. portion of people that you glamorize the politicians, the high stakes actors, whatever else, but they're this tiny sliver of the, the populace. There's everybody else, which is you and me. How do we deal with stuff? And you see that in movies like rogue one and you know, like in the Mandalorian, there's another example that we've talked extensively about. Like you see how real people or real natural creatures deal with what's left for the rest of us. Like the actors and the people up there in the clouds having the thing. What happened to everyone on the ground? Like what happened to the yeah. rest of everyone else around? Yeah, no, I actually, that's one of my, uh, so there's two things that, that you're kind of bringing up in my mind. One is that's one of the things I liked about <clears throat> the last Jedi is um which was kind of the opposite of what happens in empire so in empire um uh, uh han solo and leia they all escaped cloud city and they get there and they feel the threat of the empire and in fact even uh lando is talking about how yeah like i'm you know i'm uh we're small enough that we don't need to be you know the empire leaves us alone and in fact he even betrays his friend because he thinks he's saving his city and he even says hey I, you know i've i i wanted to help you but i got my own problems you know and it's just like he he's trying to deal with the threat of being on the outskirts of a very big war that is now at his doorstep mm -hmm. and you know that feels getting worse all the time yeah. um uh then on the other side in the last jedi when um, uh, you have uh, uh, Finn who is going off to Canto Bite um, and he's with Rose and they're there and you basically see like, here's the resistance turn rebellion fighting for their lives, hoping out, uh, out for all hope against for freedom. And there's these people that are just having a great party and they're living like uh, everything's just fine. Uh, because uh, you're always going to have two sides of this coin, which is when you have struggles like this, when you have people that are struggling for rights and freedom, you have a group of people that are are worried that are trying to stay neutral because they're worried about what could happen to them mm -hmm. and 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 might and 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 how that could literally take away their livelihoods, like what's happening to Lando, and then you have people that are like, I could care less because I'm a part of this problem. And so as long as the wheels are grinding and yep. it doesn't affect me, I'm actually going to keep drinking on my Canto bite. Uh, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be having a good time. And, and the, I loved those parallels. What's another really great thing is people are always like, Oh, leave your politics out of star Wars, leave your politics out of this or that. And it's just you like, can't. Hey, by the by, like everything's been political since forever. Um, uh, like all comic books, for example, like every time someone talks to me about like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, they Marvel and, and Disney and everybody should stay out of politics. And it's like, Hey, guess what guys? Like that stuff's been political since way back when, like, if you want to, uh, uh, last time I checked, uh, it was captain America that was knocking out Hitler, um, in the 1940s. <laughs> and, uh, and I, don't again, think like, I don't think you get much more political than that. No, exactly. I mean, he's literally <laughs> punching out Hitler. Uh, uh, and then also you have Superman who fights for tr truth, 
justice and the American way. Um, these are political characters. He's literally dressed like an American flag. Um, uh, you have episodes of Star Trek, for example, where in the original series, uh, like one one of the episodes, uh, of course, I can't remember, it's in the third season. It's all about the um, uh, American Constitution, the U.S. Constitution. These are 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 <laughs> uh, object. These characters are stand-ins for the struggles that we are trying to get to. Yeah. And every time I hear people are like, oh, this isn't political. It always, always, always is. Star Trek has been, uh, Star Wars has been political since its inception. And in fact, if you read the original novelization, which is behind me here, which it says it's uh, written by George Lucas, but I believe the ghostwriter is Alan Dean Foster. And I think he wrote Splinter of the Mind's Eye too. Um, uh, the opening forward, is basically describes the emperor not as we would think of as Emperor Palpatine. We, we we would not. He is a guy who's just a really you know big politician. And there's a line in that book that I have remembered since I picked up this book at a garage sale when I was a kid, and and I was like, oh, Star Wars comes in book form. Um, uh, it is a line that says, "The Republic, like all great trees, rotted from the inside out." And I, I liked that as a warning that it's easy for an or like, and you look at something like the high Republic and all of these things, how do you get from this golden age yeah. to this, this, this departure of that, where, where it's so easy to subjugate people, where it's so easy to do these horrible things, um, where uh, the, the empire, the Republic looks like it's a mixture of different aliens, different peoples. And the empire looks like it's homo sapiens only uh, humans only uh, culture. And uh, you get to, you get to this point where it's like, oh, it's because it rotted from the inside. Um, uh, and so I, I, you know, what you want to attribute that rot to, we can all talk about that. But I, I, I think about that a lot. I, I, I and I always think about how, um, uh, again, English major, uh, uh, the, the, the degree largely useless, except for my ability to say all art is political. And it's important to remember that um, uh, because it helps us to tell stories that helps to hopefully prevent people um, uh, like your Nazis or like your uh, uh, dictatorships. Uh, it, 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 it is, it, these, these things act as warnings to try to say, hey, um, uh, this is how things like fascism start. Um, and, uh, and it's, and it's, it's, it, it is a kind of a slippery slope on how you get there. And it starts with the, um, uh, as Yoda would say, the, the quicker, easier path something that will help support, rush to help you in a fight. Um, these are the things that you need to avoid. Um, and so those are the things that I've always loved about Star Wars. And by the by, I could do this with almost all of Star Wars <laughs> that's out there. It's all saying the same thing. You know it's all kind I, of acting as a, as a disclaimer for, you know, watch out. It's you know? so true. I, I'm with you 100%. I, I, and pulling out a little bit of, the little bit of Greek literature knowledge that I have. I'm thinking, I think it's Aristophanes who, who talked about like either life imitating art or art imitating life, one of the two. But the idea that, and I think this is so true, you mentioned politics, but I think I, I think it, it is that and it is sort of life in general mimics or art in general mimics the life that we lead and echoes it. So like, this is not a Star Wars reference, but one of my one of my favorite books that I've read actually a few different times is called The Forever War. And it's a mm. it is a direct allegory of the Vietnam conflict where it takes place in the future where like time travel isn't a thing. We can like jump to other star systems and fight somebody, but it requires sort of like being in like a stasis for a period of time. So for you, it's like days, but real mm. world time, it's like months or years. And these people go to fight a, a, an enemy they don't really ever see. We only conflict them and meet them once or twice. We don't really understand the conflict of what it's supposed to be. They misunderstood us. And by the time the two main characters reach the sort of end of this, what they realize is that it's a thousand years in the future. And every time they stopped along the way and they came out of cryo and they can go back to Earth, Earth has changed so dramatically that like, they don't even recognize it anymore. And the interesting, and it is meant to be a direct allegory of the Vietnam conflict, but the way it's what it's supposed to be explained is try to get people to understand. I think Star Wars does a great job of this um, with the non-Jedi stuff. The Jedi stuff, I think, is helpful to be inspirational and make you critically think. But I think, or I feel like, a lot of the other stories that exist help you understand or help sort of take 
things that are happening for us and put them into, again, it's sort of the storytelling that you and I've talked about, like parables or Psalms or whatever. Yeah, it exactly. puts it into a form that like, it's a complex thing that is happening in the real world. We put it into this story form fiction, which I love because it takes you out of the real world for a bit, but it lets you, it changes your mindset out of that sort of fixed mindset of what we focus on, like Harold Dweck would say, into sort of a growth mindset where we can look at something just different because it's a different yep. type of story. We have no preconceived notions of it. It's just a story. And we listen and we get a theme out of it. We're like, oh, I hadn't really thought about it like that. And then when you just stop for a moment and overlay that on top of reality, you're like, oh, I can put that on this scenario. That's like that. Um, it's sort of like that back in when we were like in middle school where they had the overhead projector and the little transparent thing they put on there. They wrote with marker and then they the teacher would take it off and write another one to show you up on the overhead and like write something with marker or a math problem. I feel like it's that like you could lay it on this projector or that projector or this projector. And it's going to give you the same sort of idea based on the scenario you're in. And a lot of Star Wars stories for me do that. They It's an art that is mimicking, mimicking the life that was happening at that point when it was written. Um, to circle back on the Canto Bite thing, you mentioned this. And I don't remember Rose's statement, but when her and Finn walk out to this balcony, and he's like, I don't know what oh, you're yeah. talking about. This place is amazing. This is great. And she's like, uh-huh, I grew up here. It's not, it's not amazing. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. It looks all fantastic. And then sees the races of those creatures down below. She's like, I want you to look. I want you to take a good look. I don't, I'm, I'm paraphrasing her words. But oh, he yeah. kind of stops and he looks down and what he sees is these creatures riding and getting smacked and like cuts on their back and the kids in the stables being like, you can see them from a distance being whipped. And I, I thought that was a really interesting thing called out, not because people are being abused. That's, that's horrible and terrible, but mm -hmm. th what she was calling out there is exactly what you said. There's this, there's us who are not affected and there's the others and it creates this series yeah. of others and it's easy to demonize those others because you can't relate to them because you are physically distant and that movie and that scene was a really strong portrayal of that happening where there's these people in the casino and they're having a great time and living the life and drinking the the things and the stuff and you look down oh there's people racing it's fun it's you know it's like it's like the kentucky derby bunch of white people get together and they get the big hats and look everything's fine but if you step back and actually look at what's really happening, it's not that simple. It's never yeah. that simple. There's a through yeah. line there that you're probably missing that is really important that you just need to step 100 feet away from or, or you know, metaphorically step away from and look at and go, oh, crap. Yeah, this I is mean, all, I, it, and like they did a great job of the camera, the camera and the, the design of that, because think about it. The people in the Canto by Casino are up here on the backs mm -hmm. of the people down here doing the grunt work in the stables. Like I'm sure that was not lost on um, Ryan Johnson when he designed, when he created that film, that, that videography and the design, the way that, that the camera angles are set. Like they're not just down there racing for fun because that's, that could be a flat with them. It could be looking out at them like a, like a horse race at like um, Los Alamitos or something. Like it, it's not that it's, it's below you are above yep. on the backs of this thing that is creating this world for you. But because you can't see them unless you walk over and look down intentionally, you can step away and completely forget that that world exists. It's really easy to distance yourself. And I, I love I love the depth that that creates because it, if you stop and think about it for a minute, it makes you realize that there is an underline, again, a through line that is happening that all the stuff that we know and love in life is being built on top of that we often don't think about, but many people are affected by, and it would really help if we understood that a little bit better. I know this is getting sort of like existential oh, here, no. but it, I think it helps to talk about because this is not just true for star Wars. I love star Wars. I love the stories, everything about it, mm -hmm. but this is true for a lot of movies and a lot of literature that is written, maybe fiction, but it is written in a way that helps you understand a deeper motivation or thing that's happening in the real world that's really hard to convey if you just try to explain it so you tell a fictional yep. story in some cases and it, it it starts to get you to connect with those nuance in a way that you hadn't thought you could because you don't feel a defensive mechanism like well don't tell me that i'm a republican and i think this or i'm a liberal and i think that or i'm a whatever group i identify with religious or otherwise don't tell me these things no problem read this fiction book oh wow that really hurts okay, by the way, that fiction book was an allegory for this thing that's actually happening. But because I didn't use these labels, you didn't feel defensive about it. I think that's yep. important to remember. No, and I, I think that that's a, it's a timeless way to tell a story. Um, I, and, and by the by, I feel like um, now people are always looking for... Um, 
they're looking to categorize the art that they consume as it falls into this political camp or falls into this one. I either need to love and support it or I need to hate it. And that's kind of the effects of tribalism that yeah. we are we are experiencing right now. Um, and that's why I feel like The Last Jedi, which is my favorite of three um, sequel trilogy movies, um, not the least of which is because it's got a definitive vision that it's trying to tell. Um, uh, I feel like The Last Jedi is trying to do a lot of really great things in what is the great history of what Star Wars is. And one of the things that comes up is exactly like what you're talking about, where you've got two characters that are trying to, uh, in an allegory-like way, and at times very pointed way, to talk about um, uh, uh, how there is a group of people that can be so disenfranchised that they have literally nothing. And by the by, that's who folk heroes are for that's who that's where faith lives that's why when the jedi when the kid pulls the broom handle it's of course the stable boy because um that's where faith lives faith lives in places where it is the darkest and even when they're talking about things like you know the uh, uh this is this is essentially where our where a hope lives uh if you if you uh i think it's the a line that poe says and he's trying to quote leia which is also something that the laura dern uh character i think admiral holdo uh mm -hmm. she brings up which is um uh if if you uh, uh faith is uh, uh hope and faith these are things that uh if the sun shined all the time you you know you wouldn't need hope and faith it's it's you need those things in the dark mm -hmm. um so you have these characters Characters who, of course, this is these stories are meant for them, not the people that they see themselves already as the heroes um, uh, and uh, are already, in fact, making choices that are only for them. That's also the Benicio del Toro character, that DJ character that you get, who's like, hey, I'm looking out for my own skin. And by the way, not all of us are going to hunt on solo this in the end and look to help you out. Um, simultaneously, so you've got one of these characters, these marginalized characters who are so who are the lowest character as your main character, your main hero character in The Last Jedi, who is Rey, um, who is the light in the story. And um, she is told by her counterpart when um, when when it's uh, at her at, at her biggest at, at the biggest moment of this movie and Empire, the biggest moment of the movie is Luke finding out that the man who he thought killed his father is, in fact, his father. Yikes. That is a character defining moment. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> spoilers for Empire. Um, but in uh, in The Last Jedi, it's Rey who is being told at the moment that she has is going to hear a truth is that her parents were nobody. And by the way, I really like that story. <laughs> I really liked that story. Um, and I also found what happens immediately after to be a very interesting political move in the story, which is um, Kylo Ren then provides the greatest gaslight that I've ever seen in a movie, <laughs> which is he says, um, you're nothing. You're no one. You're nothing to this story except to me. And uh, that's like crazy gaslighting. That is like some crazy manipulative language, which is you are worthless except in my definition of you, except in what, how you are the, uh, how you are an object to me, the subject. And, um, uh, and uh, Adam, Driver, Adam Driver does such a good job in that point. Cause he's like, yeah. he's like, you're nothing. You're nothing. And he's, yeah, he says nothing. it like, yeah. in just such a dismissive, like you're nothing. Like, I don't yeah. even know what you're except talking about. You're just, you're totally nothing. You're nothing except to me. Except to yeah, me. And, like, it's like, when you hear him say it, you're like, I almost feel like, oh, God, I feel icky in my stomach. Like, yeah, what's just it's happening? Terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. And, and that is, and, and that's what I mean by you, you've got classes of people in real life yeah. who are like, oh, you're just the side characters to me, the star of life. And it's like, that is, um, uh, that's a real thing that needed to be tackled. I actually feel that the three Star Wars trilogies are really great reflections of where things are in the world when they came out. Totally agree. And, yes. um, uh, you know, it's funny how George Lucas and a lot of authors do this. A lot of, uh, uh, artists do this. They'll say, oh, I don't, I don't see the thing that you're reading into my art. 
And it's like, that's fine. That's that some, some things are unintentional and some things are for the viewer to find those arguments there and to make those arguments in the artwork. Because I feel like you see Vietnam and you see the eighties, the early eighties in the original Star Wars movies. Yes. And you actually see the end of the nineties, the pointless nineties <laughs> inside of Phantom Menace. Um, it's funny because they're like, gosh, wasn't Phantom Menace kind of boring? You're talking about trade federation and trade policies. And it's like, does anyone remember the 90s? Like, like we like, we, hey, we I remember we, Soundgarden. We, that's all you <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it was so like, uh, but I worked at the gap in the 90s. I, I could not be more 90s. There was, there, there, and by the way, this is no shade on the gap, but back in the 90s, you know, we like, it was just, it was so vanilla. Everything was so vanilla. And um, uh, if you and wanted, so, if you wanted some like, some like, uh, fringe something you went to hot topic for a hot minute and you bought a band t-shirt and that was about it i I think i had a chain for my wallet they got from hot topic i'm like look i'm cool yes no i had my i had my uh carpenter pants my tight on top very baggy on the bottom um uh uh, 90s look but my 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 point about that is is that you look at those prequel movies and they are so much a reflection of when they're coming out where you've got the um uh 90s nothingness uh it seems significant and yet is not in phantom menace and then you get the after effects of 9 11 where you have uh which for me was uh, life changing, um, uh, and you get nine eleven that happens, and 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 it totally alters how you look at that opening scene in episode two. Mm-hmm. You you start to see um, uh, reactionary people like Anakin, very reactionary. You see a war in the desert of Geonosis, um, and then that culminates in in a in a war and a new version of what this government was coming out of episode three. And by the way. Uh, George Lucas took a lot of flack for that. People were like, what are you trying to say? Is this about the Bush administration? Is this about this? Is this about the war in Iraq? And he was like, no, I'm talking about Vietnam. No, you are 100% talking about the things that are happening around you. It's like saying that that you can make, it's like somehow you can make it, it, making the same, whether he sat back and said, I am making this ending look this way because of the war in Iraq. Okay, did he do that? Who knows? Probably not. Probably not. No, but, to it comes that, in to think that to think those that actions those that were happening that. in the world did not yes. directly impact the way that it looked. That's folly. Like no one, because there's no, especially an artist nor yep. normal person, let alone an artist could not have those real world things influencing what they do every day. I don't care if you say I let it pass. That's complete horseshit. You did. There's no way yep. as a human being you did. It influenced you in some way, whether or not it's overt and how it came out at the end. My favorite part about the ending of the Clone Wars movie is when they're on that balcony and Palpatine's standing up front. He has now been nominated. He's now the, the new Supreme Chancellor. And you see all the oh, yeah. all the, the new uh, fleet of ships starting to lift up and all the clones. And Bail Organa just stand there and he just kind of like takes his fist and hits the balcony. Yeah. And he like hits that balcony. Not hard, but just like this like like this i'm frustrated but almost like a resignation like well this is what we're in now and like we have to this is what we've got to deal with now and it's like i think his for me that showcased to me like what the rest of us were feeling those of us who were like awake enough to realize what was actually happening um at that time it's like for me that like showcased it because it was like padme gives her own statement and it's fine it's meaningful but that action by Bale in that moment, Jimmy Smith's in that moment was like, <sighs> yes, it's it's a, I am frustrated. I did this, but I'm like, ah, I didn't punch a wall. Like, oh my God. No, it's not overt anger. It's, well, shit. Okay. No, it, it, so here it, we it, are. It now, what, now what do I do? Like you could tell yeah. like in his actions, like now what do I do next? And that's where Fulcrum, Fulcrum came from out of Rebels and how the rebellion even started and Mon Mothma and everybody else who came out of that, like, that's the beginning of it right there. Like you could see it in him. Like that was going to, that was an inevitable conclusion of what he felt in that moment because the start of the clone wars for so many people was like, it was, this was going to be the conclusion of what happened at that point. And it just, yeah, it's it, it. There's so much we can unpack with that as far as what happened in real life at the time. But for anyone to say like, like, 
this is a direct allegory for 9-11 or for the Iraq war. No, it's probably not. A, it's not an allegory because allegorical means that he he intentionally chose that. I highly doubt that Lucas did that. But to think it wasn't heavily influenced by, oh, that's horseshit. Like, of course, it no, like, no. that was happening I, in I, real life. Like, it was, of course, it I, influenced you in some way. Yeah. And life, you, you talked about how, you know, life imitating art, art imitating life. And again, like I remember George Lucas doing this, like I want to say it was 2020 and someone's interview and they're like, yeah, you know, we're seeing these parallels. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, those those parallels don't exist. And it's like, yeah, they do. And um, uh, and and by the by, like uh, I, I uh, as someone who used to have to write papers that was like this. If you can make an argument, like, and I'm, and I'm, and by the way, you can make a lot of really crazy arguments, but if you can make a really cogent argument and back it up with evidence and, and really show a literary criticism and say, this is, this is, I see, I have this reading of Attack of the Clones, or I have this reading of Revenge of the Sith, and this is what's informing that reading because I can see all these things, th that to me is legit. Like, uh, uh, now I could say that, um, you know, the movie Super Troopers is an indictment of capitalism, <laughs> late, late 20th century capitalism, but I, I would fail Don't in that argument. Don't even get started on that. Okay, I'm totally <laughs> uh, I would fail in that argument because uh, it's obviously about, you know, post-agrarian society. Um, uh, but in reality, it's like, it, it's one of these things where, uh, I, I I often think that art um, art finds its meaning in being viewed rather than in its creation. It's just Agreed. like how art art is made better in refinement. Art is it, art's meaning is found in who is viewing it. Just like with music, with everything, it's like um, uh, you you get those. Um, recognition of themes that come out of those things uh, uh out of out of out of it being perceived it really is one of those like not to get too cliche about it but it's like uh does a you know does if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it does it make a sound if art is created but no one is there to view it or hear it or or take it in um does it have a uh, meaning does it have does it is it, it does it have a statement mm -hmm. all of these things are meant to be perceived and in fact that's one of the reasons why i struggle with a lot of things that are thrown up on the screen right now now or comic books that I see that are just like uh, it's because the only point of it is to make money and it has no other value it has no vision that they're trying to get to and I, I know that things like uh, The Force Awakens was very uh, accessible and it was a very nice soft reboot of the Star Wars franchise which I enjoyed I went and saw freaking Force yeah. Awakens like three four times um, uh, and Last Jedi was very divisive and honestly, I walked out of The Last Jedi and it like I was like thinking about that movie. Like it like stuck with me for a while. And that's why I do have my issues with Rise of Skywalker, because I feel like Disney was like, ooh, we've got to force a conclusion. We've got to force yeah. a conclusion to happen here. How do we do that? Yeah. So let's do this yeah. on the next show. Let's talk about that like forced conclusion that was the the rise of Skywalker. Cause I agree with you. Yeah, I loved, I loved the creation of the, the last shot because it, it, it wasn't the darkness. It was a, it was a, it was a grunginess. It was a sort of like getting in the weeds of like what makes people make the decisions they make. And I, I actually really loved that version of Luke Skywalker, not version, but that stage of Luke Skywalker's life. He went from yeah. not knowing anything to knowing a little bit, to knowing everything and becoming a Jedi. And then how, how did he get here? I'd be really interested to learn what the hell happened to him in that time period, because you, you don't yeah. just get there because of some random reason, but I'm with you. Like I enjoyed entertainment wise watching the rise of Skywalker, but to me it, it felt oh, yeah. very much like how do we force a conclusion to all of these things into one movie? And it's like, I understand why you did it, but I am a little kind of like, uh, I'm not a huge fan of that. The idea of how you went about it. There's parts of it that I love, but we're yeah. like 50 minutes into this and I would love to keep talking, but let's put a, <laughs> let's put a button on it for this week. And then next yeah. week we can talk about a bit more about the rise of Skywalker. So we have our topic for next week, but this is perfect. Uh, exactly. Uh, by the way, release the Trevoro cut. There's your new hashtag. There's your new hashtag. Start a hashtag. Yeah, <laughs> Anyone between now and our next session, um, I'm, I'm banging on my desk. My lights even just fell over because I'm. He is so intense right now about this. His lights oh, yeah. are shutting off. The office oh, no, is like Ryan. Not, I cannot like handle a, your intensity. It's like it's like you gotta settle down. The lights. Um, but I will say that the the one thing that if you between next show and the, uh, this show and the next, if you find the Colin Trevorrow script, I'd recommend taking a look at it. It's called Duel of the Fates. 
And in my opinion, the best thing that Disney could have done was say, hey, you know what? It doesn't need to be a trilogy. Maybe it's two movies. And um, I do think Ryan Johnson left them in a kind of a lurch at the end of that one, at the end of The Last Skywalker. I think it could have been two movies. I can't wait to get into this topic in our next session. Awesome. Everybody, thank you so much for joining the Kessel Chat again. You can find Ryan at Ryan Rose on Twitter. I'm Jeff Voltech yep. on Twitter and all the other socials too. You can find us on the Kessel Chat. We're everywhere. It's cool stuff. Thank you for being here and watching the show. We really appreciate it. Have an amazing night, and we will see you soon. Hey, thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Bye.